This six-speed manual transmission can reliably handle over 1,000 horsepower and 700 pound-foot of torque. It's called the Tremec T56 Magnum XL, and it's essentially the aftermarket version of the TR6060 found on Camaros, Corvettes, Hellcats, GT500s, and even the late great 5th gen Dodge Viper. The XL model you see here is specifically designed for 2005 and newer Mustang GTs, and in this video, you'll learn everything you need to know about this transmission, find out what supporting parts are required to make the conversion on your Mustang, and I'll show you how to install one all by yourself in an easy to follow step by step process. We'll be installing this transmission on my built 2000. 2007 Mustang GT, which is the last major upgrade I need to do before I can finally install my turbo kit. But first, let's talk a little more about this transmission. The T56 Magnum is the kingpin of Tremec's high performance lineup. From badass old school Camaros to record breaking Supras, it's the go-to gearbox for high horsepower manual builds. It descends from the original T56 developed by Borg Warner in the early 90s for GM's next generation of muscle cars and Dodge's RT10 Viper. And while similar in design to the original T56, the T56 Magnum is a significantly more capable transmission that shouldn't be confused with its OEM predecessor. Tremec offers the Magnum in a generic form with multiple shifter locations and platform-specific variants like the Magnum F for F-bodies and the Magnum XL for Mustangs. The letters XL on the Mustang version stand for Extended Length, which refers to the extended length of the tailcase. This allows for a direct mount shifter on S197 and S550 Mustangs, which is a big improvement over the semi-remote shifter on the stock transmission that's often the cause of missed shifts at high RPMs. All T56 Magnums have six gears and are available in a couple different ratios. Tremec has a handy tool on their website for helping you choose a ratio by estimating your vehicle speed at a given RPM. I decided to go with the longer 266 gear since this will be a turbo car making well over 700 horsepower. Now let's identify a few things on this transmission so you know exactly what you're looking at. At the front of the T56 Magnum is a beefy 26 blind input shaft. This is where rotational energy from the engine is delivered to the transmission. These two holes are for adding and removing fluid, the top ones for filling and the bottom ones for draining. This is the vehicle's speed sensor, or VSS. It tells the vehicle's computer how fast the rear wheels are spinning by monitoring the rotational speed of the output shaft. Up here by the shifter is the reverse lockout solenoid. Its job is to prevent you from making the catastrophic mistake of shifting into reverse on the highway. Oh, it's in reverse! At the back of the transmission is a 31 spline output shaft with a slip yoke design, which is quite a bit different than the flange setup on the TR3650s and MT82s. On the right hand side is the reverse light sensor. It tells the vehicle's computer when you've put the transmission in reverse so it can switch on the reverse lights. And this mysterious black tube that runs across the top is just a vent for the gearbox. Now when you buy a T56 Magnum XL, it'll usually come with a bell housing, cross member, and shifter assembly. But there are a number of other parts necessary to make the conversion. First, you'll need to get a 26 blind clutch to match the Magnum's 26 blind input shaft. I went with this McLeod RXT twin disc that's rated for 1000 horsepower, which is right on target for this build. This clutch kit also came with a billet aluminum flywheel, which should free up some horsepower as it's less than half the weight of the steel one that's on the car now. It's also a good idea to replace or upgrade your hydraulic release bearing. I went with an OEM unit from Ford because my stock one held up to over 70,000 miles of abuse without any issues. Now since the T56 Magnum is longer than the stock transmission and has a yoke style output shaft, you'll need a shorter drive shaft with a 31 spline barrel to match. I originally went with this drive shaft from Dinotech, but the rear flange was too wide for the pinion flange, so I ended up ordering another one from DSS that fit perfectly. And finally, you'll need an extension to hook up the reverse light sensor and a harness to wire up the lockout solenoid. Now instead of sourcing all these parts individually like I did, I recommend getting a full conversion kit from Lethal Performance or JPC Racing. Their websites make it easy to customize your kit and you'll have the peace of mind knowing all the parts are compatible. Expect to pay around $6,500 depending on which parts and options you choose. Now since we'll be doing the swap on a 2007 Mustang GT with a 4.6 3-valve engine, many of the bolt sizes and torque specs I'll be rattling off are specific to this vehicle. But the overall conversion process is very similar for S197 and S550 Mustang GTs equipped with the MT82. In terms of tools, we'll mostly be using a bunch of sockets ranging from 10 to 19 millimeters, a few extensions, and a torque wrench. But I'll tell you what to use as we go. We start things off by disconnecting the battery and pinching the hose on the brake fluid reservoir. Next, we need to disconnect the hydraulic line by the brake booster that goes to the slave cylinder. It's a pretty confined area, so consider unbolting the AC accumulator to make a little more room for your hands. Stuff some rags or paper towels under the fitting to catch any fluid that leaks out. Then use a pick tool to remove the clip from the fitting. Be sure to not lose this clip as your clutch is pretty much useless without it. Then pull out the hydraulic line and clean up any fluid that spills out since brake fluid will eat through your car's paint. In the cabin, unlatch the shifter boot and remove the shifter knob by rotating it counterclockwise. 
Then open the center compartment and remove the two screws at the back. Now you can remove the center console by lifting it from the rear and pulling up on the e-brake. Now if you haven't already, it's time to raise the car. You'll want the base of the car to be at least 26 inches off the ground so you can roll the transmissions in and out. And as we'll find out later, this quick jack doesn't quite get the vehicle high enough. However you go about lifting your Mustang, please make sure it's done safely as getting crushed by your own car is both an embarrassing and agonizing way to leave this world. The first thing we'll be doing under the car is removing the cross brace under the bell housing. It's held in a place with four 15mm nuts and should be pretty easy to remove. Disconnect the downstream O2 sensors, then remove the bolts holding the midpipe to the headers. This long tube setup from Cooks uses four 15mm bolts with 14mm nuts. Once you've disconnected the midpipe from the headers, loosen the 15mm nuts on the clamps until you can pull the midpipe out, then remove it from under the car. This Mustang has an aftermarket single piece aluminum drive shaft. The front of the drive shaft bolts to the transmission flange with four 12 mm bolts. With the transmission in gear and the e-brake engaged, use a good sized breaker bar to loosen the bolts. It'll take a good amount of force to break these bolts loose. Gotcha. To access the bolts on the top, release the e-brake and put the transmission in neutral. Then you should be able to rotate the drive shaft by hand. Use an eight mm hex socket to remove the six bolts that hold the drive shaft to the pinion flange. Now we can disconnect the drive shaft and remove the adapter plate that this drive shaft required to mount to the pinion flange. Next we'll be removing the starter. It's held in a place with three 10 mm bolts and one of those bolts is tucked under the cylinder head making it kind of difficult to get to. I recommend removing your battery so you can access it through the engine bay. Luckily the battery on this Mustang has been relocated to the trunk so I didn't have to deal with moving it. Once you've got the top bolt out, we'll continue removing the starter from under the car. Disconnect the power wires by removing the positive wires 13 mm nut and the negative wires 10 mm nut. Just leave the nuts on the terminal so we don't lose them. Then use a small socket wrench with an extension to back out the remaining two 10 mm bolts and remove the starter from the engine. Now we'll get to work on actually removing the transmission. We'll start by removing the drain plug with a 3 8 drive and letting the fluid drain out. Be sure to use a pan or a container to catch the fluid. Once the transmission's been drained, clean up your mess and reinsert the drain plug. Then remove the two 10 mm nuts holding the shifter to the body and the 13 mm bolt at the center of the cross member. Use a breaker bar with an 18 mm socket to loosen the four cross member bolts. But before you remove them, support the transmission with a floor jack. Then you can remove the bolts and the cross member. With the cross member out of the way, disconnect the reverse light sensor and the vehicle speed sensor. And remove any zip ties or fasteners that may be attaching wires to the transmission. Use a breaker bar with a 13 mm socket to loosen the three bell housing bolts on the driver's side. If the upstream O2 sensor is getting in the way, you can remove it with an adjustable wrench. Just back these bolts out a bit for now. Then do the same thing for the two bell housing bolts on the passenger side. To break the top driver side bolt loose, I lowered the transmission until the intake manifold was touching the firewall. Then I used a 13 mm deep socket attached to a half inch swivel adapter and a couple extensions. Then I raised the transmission as high as it could go so I could access the top passenger side bolt through the engine bay. After loosening the top passenger side bolt, I used a small socket wrench to back out both bolts until they are easy enough to remove by hand. Once you've removed the two top bolts from the bell housing, flip the floor jack around and support the transmission by its flange to make room for some kind of transmission lift. I'm using this less than optimal transmission jack from Harbor Freight, but it's way better than nothing. Once the transmission is securely supported by a lift, you can remove the floor jack. From inside the cabin, remove the top 13 mm bolt from the lever and rotate it all the way down. Now remove the remaining bell housing bolts we loosened earlier. There should be three on the driver's side and two on the passenger side. Once all the bolts have been removed, start trying to separate the transmission from the engine. It'll only come out a couple inches before the bell housing hits the transmission tunnel. At this point, carefully lower and wiggle the transmission out bit by bit until it fully separates. Once you've got the transmission out, disconnect the hydraulic line by releasing the clip and pulling up on the line. Unfortunately, this transmission is too tall to just roll out from under the car. So I laid down a bath towel and carefully rolled the transmission onto it. Then I was able to pretty easily drag it out from under the car without scratching up the floor of the transmission. Now we can get to work on removing the clutch and flywheel. Remove the pressure plate bolts in a crisscross pattern and leave one of the top bolts for last so the pressure plate doesn't unexpectedly fall on your face. This flywheel is held into place with eight 17 mm bolts, and you'll probably find that trying to remove them causes the crankshaft to spin. Poke an extension or a screwdriver through one of the empty holes to prevent it from rotating. After you remove the flywheel, inspect the rear main seal for oil leaks and the pilot bearing for excess wear. 
This engine was rebuilt less than 8,000 miles ago and everything still looks really good. So we're going to move on to installing the new clutch and flywheel. This twin disc clutch and flywheel combo from McLeod is made up of five distinct parts. The pressure plate, top clutch disc, friction floater plate, bottom clutch disc, and the flywheel. These components must be installed in a specific order and orientation as they've been balanced as a unit. The flywheel also uses a number of spacers and shims to ensure proper clearances. Be sure to not let these fall off as you'll likely put them back on in the wrong place, causing your clutch to be out of spec. We'll leave the nuts on the flywheel studs until it's been bolted up to prevent this from happening. Back under the car, clean out the threads on the crankshaft with a tube wire brush that's been sprayed with brake cleaner. Once you've cleaned up the crankshaft, place the bell housing index plate on the dowels, then place the flywheel on the crankshaft. Rotate the flywheel so its holes align with the crankshafts. There's only one way for them to line up. We'll be using a fresh set of 16mm ARP bolts to fasten the flywheel to the crank. ARP recommends applying a small amount of their fastener lubricant to the area around the threads to prevent the bolts from gouging into the aluminum when they're torqued down. After you've done that, apply a bead of red Loctite to the bottom of the flywheel bolts and install them until they're hand tight. Then place a breaker bar on the crank pulley to prevent the crankshaft from rotating and torque the flywheel bolts to 70 pound foot in a crisscross pattern. Clean up any leftover fastener grease and wipe down the friction area with brake cleaner. It's important we don't leave any oil or grease on the surfaces that will be in contact with the clutch pads. Place the bottom clutch on the flywheel in the correct orientation and hold it in place with the supplied alignment tool. Then remove the three floater plate nuts. Clean both sides of the floater plate with brake cleaner, then place it on the flywheel with the markings aligned. Torque the three half inch floater plate nuts to 25 pound foot. You should be able to spin the bottom disc and there should also be a very small amount of play. If the disc is unable to spin or it feels like there's a lot of play, you should contact McLeod before continuing. If all is good, clean the floater plate again and remove the six pressure plate nuts. Place the top clutch disc in the correct orientation and reinsert the alignment tool. Clean the pressure plate's friction area, then place it on the flywheel with the markings aligned. Place the nuts on the studs, but don't tighten them down yet. This is where things get tricky. I read that these plastic alignment tools are pretty sloppy and often result in the splines on the clutch disc being misaligned. This means the input shaft could get stuck on the second disc and we wouldn't be able to mount the transmission. To avoid this potential headache, I rolled in the T56 Magnum and raised it up so I could use its input shaft to align the clutch discs. Then I torqued the pressure plate bolts to 35 pound foot as indicated by McLeod. Whether or not you take this extra step or just use the alignment tool is totally up to you. Now it's time to bolt up the bell housing. Move the harnesses out of the way and place the bell housing on the dowels. The bell housing is held in place with 7 14mm bolts on the bottom and 7 8mm hex bolts on the top. Two of the top bolts have spacers and are longer than the rest. These are for the dowels and we'll be putting those in first. The bolt with a crescent shaped spacer goes on the passenger side. For the bottom bolts, place the large washer on the bolt head side and the lock washer on the nut side. Once you've hand tightened all the bolts, torque them to 45 pound foot. Now we need to prep the transmission for installation. Roll the transmission on its side and bolt up the provided cross member insulator mount. For these bolts, I put the lock washer between the bolt head and the flat washer. I also added a dab of blue Loctite. Torque the 19 millimeter bolts to 35 pound foot. Next, we'll be installing our new hydraulic release bearing. This part is also known as a slave cylinder or throw out bearing. But before we put it on the transmission, let's prime it with some fresh brake fluid by pushing the bearing all the way down, submerging the line in fluid, and slowly releasing the bearing. This will reduce the time it takes to bleed the clutch later. Now place it on the input shaft and bolt it up with the two 10 millimeter bolts from the old transmission. Remove the elbow fitting from the old slave cylinder and place it on the new one. And don't forget to insert the retaining clip. The T56 isn't nearly as tall since it doesn't have an integrated bell housing. This enabled me to snake it in from the back of the car by putting it on its side. Once you're ready to raise the transmission, apply a small amount of lithium grease to the nose of the input shaft and its splines. Position the transmission on the lift so that the input shaft is pointed upwards. Then begin raising it. Once it's about halfway up, connect the hydraulic line to the elbow fitting and make sure to push down the retaining clip. Keep raising the transmission with the input shaft right up against the bell housing. Once the flange has been cleared, nudge the transmission towards the clutch while you keep raising it. Before we try to mount the transmission, free up the harnesses and drape them over the gearbox. Then position the input shaft at the center of the diaphragm fingers as best you can and pull the transmission towards the engine. Supporting the engine with a floor jack should help put the engine and the transmission on the same plane. Push, wiggle, and rotate the transmission from the tail case until the face plate makes contact with the bell housing. This will probably take adjusting the floor jack and the transmission lift multiple times. 
Then bolt up the transmission to the bell housing with the eight 15 millimeter bolts and torque them to 35 pound foot. I chained a few extensions together to get to the top bolts. Connect the reverse light extension on the driver side, then drape it over the gearbox to the passenger side so you can connect the reverse light sensor. Then connect the output shaft speed sensor. Now I was planning on wiring up the reverse lockout solenoid, but after messing around shifting gears, I found it took just the right amount of force to get the transmission into reverse without help from the solenoid, so I decided to leave it as is. Place the crossmember on the insulator studs and tighten the nuts just enough to hold the crossmember in place. Then raise the transmission a bit so you can install the four 18mm crossmember bolts. Once you've got them hand tight, torque them to 45 pound foot. Then torque the 19mm nuts on the mount to 46 pound foot. Now it's time to fill the transmission with fluid. We'll be using this simple pump I bought from O'Reilly's to get the fluid into the gearbox. Screw the pump onto one of the bottles, then remove the fill plug with a 3 8 drive and start pumping. The T56 Magnum requires about 4 quarts of fluid and it'll take about 15 minutes to get all the fluid into the transmission with this approach. You'll know you're done when fluid starts spilling out. At that point, clean up the excess fluid and reinsert the plug. Next up is the drive shaft. Apply a thin film of white lithium grease to the outside of the drive shaft yoke and its splines. Then insert the barrel into the back of the transmission. Bolt the rear of the drive shaft to the pinion flange with the six 17 millimeter bolts and torque them to 41 pound foot or as indicated by the drive shaft's manufacturer. The barrel should extend about half an inch beyond the dust boot. If the drive shaft is pressed up against the boot, it's likely too long and may damage the drivetrain. Now it's time to reinstall the starter. Insert one of the 10 millimeter bolts through the bottom thread so that the bolt head is pointed towards the back of the car. Then rest the starter on the bolt. Insert the middle bolt the correct way and tighten it down. Then reverse the bottom bolt and do the same. Use a decent amount of hand force when tightening these bolts. Reconnect the negative wire to the solver stud and the positive wire to the wider copper stud. Tighten down the negative's 10 millimeter nut and the positive's 13 millimeter nut with a small socket until they're hand tight. Place the top bolt through the engine bay and tighten it down with a small socket. Now it's time to reconnect the exhaust system. Reinstall and reconnect the upstream O2 sensors. Slip the midpipe into the intermediate pipes, then lift the midpipe up to meet the headers. Use one of the bolts to hold everything up, then use a floor jack to support the midpipe. Tighten up the four bolts that hold the midpipe to the headers and torque them to 35 pound foot. Do the same for the four 15 millimeter clamp nuts and reconnect the downstream O2 sensors. The last thing we'll be doing under the car is reattaching the control arm cross brace. Torque the four 15 millimeter nuts to 35 pound foot. Now it's time to put the new shifter together. Place the gear shift lever in the slot and secure it with the two 13 millimeter bolts until they're hand tight. Spin the lock nut down towards the bottom of the threads, then place the rubber seal over the lever. Push the seal under the body, then pull it up so it fully seats. Now place the center console and secure it with the two screws at the back. Place the shifter boot and spin on the boot retainer until there's about half an inch of threads above it, then spin on the shifter ball. Spin the boot retainer up towards the shifter ball until you can't. Then tighten the lock nut upwards on the retainer until it's snug. This will prevent the retainer and shifter ball from moving. And finally, clip the boot onto the retainer. Back in the engine bay, reconnect the hydraulic line to the fitting on the firewall and insert the retaining clip. Remove the clamp from the brake fluid reservoir and the reservoir's cap. Check that your brake fluid is within the indicated bounds. Mine was a little under the minimum, so I added some fluid. Now we can start bleeding the clutch by pumping the clutch pedal. At first, there will be almost no resistance, but after about a minute, you should start to notice a change. And after 15 minutes, the clutch should feel almost normal. Once you're done bleeding the clutch, don't forget to put the cap back on the reservoir. Then you can reconnect the battery, lower the car, and take it for a test drive. McLeod recommends 1200 shift cycles before any hard driving, so do a few hundred miles of city driving before really getting after it. You also want to update your Mustang's tune so the speedometer and torque management system are calibrated for the new transmission. Once you've broken in the clutch, I think you'll find the cost and effort of installing the T56 Magnum was well worth it. Shifts are precise, reliable, and easy. And now banging gears at 7000 RPM is no big deal.